Hello YouTube, this is Eric from Coder Snacks. Today, we're going to talk about summing numbers to hit a target from a given set of numbers. Let's get started. The subset sum problem is a simple version of the knapsack problem, which has applications in cryptography and resource management, and I've seen many variants of it in interview problems. This is a great study problem, and it's important to understand that in some cases there are no efficient optimum solutions. We'll explore this in more depth throughout the video. First, as always, there are some questions we should ask. How large is our input? Both how many numbers in the input, but also the size of the numbers themselves. Are they small numbers? Ints? Longs? Are they negative? How large do we expect our target to be? Also, can we use a number in our set multiple times in a solution? Or can we only use each number once? These questions change how we approach the problem, and we'll talk about some of the trade-offs we'll make depending on answers to these questions. We will assume, however, that you can only use each item once. In the general knapsack problem, you have a knapsack of a certain capacity and a bunch of treasures you want to fit in it. There are a number of other similar problems. In our version, we're doing the same thing, but returning whether or not we can fill the knapsack completely. Just think of each number as a treasure of a certain size. How do we solve this? First, let's look at a greedy solution. We sort the items from largest to smallest and go through the items, putting in items where we have capacity. For example, our sack has 18 units of space. The 19 doesn't fit, but the 11 does, leaving us with seven space left. The 10 doesn't fit, but the seven does fit perfectly, and we have our answer. In our example, this works, but what about another case? Here, we put the 16 in, and none of the rest fit. We return false. However, 10 plus 8 fills the sack completely. A greedy approach doesn't work. When we see the 16 doesn't work in the end, we need to backtrack and use a smaller element. Backtracking means recursion. How can we use recursion in this problem? Since we can only use each item once, we can break our problem with n items into two smaller problems, one where we use the first element and one where we don't. If we use the element, we subtract the size of the element from our target and recurse with the rest of our list and our new target. If we don't use it, we recurse with the rest of the list and the same target. This is our recursive case. So then, what is our base case? There are some trivial problems we can solve as our base cases. First, if our target is ever zero, then we found an answer. We just don't use any of the other items, and we can return true. Second, if our list is used up and our target isn't zero, then we can't reach our target and we can return false. Also, if we know all of the numbers are positive, if our target is ever below zero, we can also return false. If negative numbers are allowed, though, we can't do this. If you're not clear about recursion, we discuss it in some detail in our first video. Check it out here. Let's write the code to do this. First, the base cases. If the target is zero, we're done and return true. If there aren't any numbers in the list, we return false, because if the target were zero, we would have already returned true. Then, for the recursive case, if either case, using the number or not, is true, we return true. Short and sweet. We add some test cases, and we see that we get the result we expect. As a small improvement, instead of using array slices, we can pass the index as an optional variable. This avoids making a lot of list copies. Our new code is as follows. Now, what's the runtime complexity of this code? For each item, we have two choices, whether we use the item or not. In each of those two choices, for the next item, we have two more choices. With two choices for every element, our runtime is O of 2 to the n. Can we do better than this? If we want to improve the runtime of a recursive algorithm, we should think about memoization, or caching, and dynamic programming. Let's think about caching. What arguments are we calling our function with? The numbers, the target, and the index of the element we're looking at. We should be able to build a cache with those arguments. How does caching save us effort here? If we reach the same target with the same number of items used in multiple ways, it will save us from having to recalculate the two to the n choices for the rest of the elements in examples like this. 
Here, the path using 10 and 4 gives us the same target as the path using 6 and 8, and we'd have to completely redo the subproblem looking for 26 as the target in the rest of the list. Implementing the cache is straightforward. At the top, we check if we have the answer cached already, and at each return site we cache the value we're about to return. We see the code still works. Is the runtime complexity of this solution better? It's complicated, and we'll come back to that question in a moment. Certainly though, if there is duplicated recursive work, we're avoiding it. We can also implement this using dynamic programming. Let's assume for a moment that all of the elements are positive, although this can be implemented with modification for negative elements as well. Let's make a table with the elements on the left and the numbers from zero to the size of the target on the top. Each row represents the targets we can reach using the elements from that row and above. For example, this red cell will represent whether we can make a target of 9 using the elements 6, 3, and 7 once everything is filled in. In the first row, we can only use the first element, so there are only two values set to true, 0 and the row corresponding to the element. We can only reach those two targets with this one item by using it or not. Everything else is false. We can't reach it. How do we fill in the second row? For each true in the first row, we mark true in the second row in two places, the same column and the column plus the value of the element in the row we're currently filling. Here, for example, for the true at 0, we fill in trues at 0 and 0 plus 3. For the true at 6, we fill in 6 and 6 plus 3, or 9. We can reach every size we could reach with the first item, and for each of those sizes we could also use the second item and reach those values. To fill in the third row, we do the same thing with every true in the second row combined with the third element, and so on. We do this until we fill every row. At the end, if the target we want is true, the one in the bottom right representing the target we want with all the items, then we return true. Of course, we could shortcut this at any time if we see a true in the last column, since we could just not use any of the remaining items. Let's write some code to do this. We start by initializing our table and setting trues for 0 and the first number, if that number's in the table. Then, for each of our rows, we go through each column, and if we see a true, we set the next row true in the current column and our current column plus the next number, if that number's in the table. At the end, we return the value in the last column of the last row. This seems to work, but there's actually a bug in here. Pause the video and see if you can find it. The problem is when we initialize the first row of the table. We check to see if the element fits in the table, and we might think of the size of the target as the length of the row, but it's really one larger, since the list is zero indexed, and we have to include the target itself. This greater than is wrong. We need greater than or equal to. If we don't, if the first number in our list is the target, we get the wrong answer like this. Simple enough to fix though, we just add the equal sign. To make this a little easier to visualize, we'll temporarily add some code that prints the table out at the end of the dynamic programming step. If you'd like, pause the video and take a look at some of these tables. So what's our runtime complexity now? It seems like O of 2 to the n, because in each new row we could have twice as many trues to check, but there's a limit, the target size. If everything is already true, all we do is set everything in the next row to true. The complexity is O of n times k, where k is the size of the target and n is the number of elements. Another way to see this is, we do constant work to fill each cell of the table, so the runtime is O of the table size. The solution as we've shown it also takes O of n k space, but if you want, you can keep only two rows, the one you're filling and the one you're filling from, and throw the rest away as you progress. That would take O of k space. O of n k isn't exponential, and O of 2 to the n is exponential, therefore O of n k is better, right? Not so fast. It depends on the range of the elements. If there are many elements, or the target is small, the O of n k solution is better. But what if our target is large, say millions or billions, and we only have a few elements? We could have a table that's extremely large, billions of numbers, whereas if we did the simple recursive solution, we'd be only looking at 2 to the n for a small value of n. So, if the size of the knapsack is very large, 2 to the n may be better. 
It depends on the use case you're writing for. With all that in mind, let's come back to caching. In the worst case, the size of our cache, and therefore the runtime, is the size of the table, O of n k, but practically slightly worse because we're using a dictionary instead of a list. But what if the target is large with few items? In the DP solution, we'd have a table filled with falses, but the cache doesn't store values we can't reach in the recursion. In effect, it stores only the trues. We can get the best of both worlds, a solution that is faster with many items because we're limited to O of NK entries in the cache, but that can be fast when the target is large because we don't store a bunch of falses. To illustrate this, I've made a couple of cases. One has 25 numbers, but a smaller target, which would be bad for recursion. The other has a large target, but only 10 numbers, which would be bad for DP. Neither of these has a solution, so both solutions take the longest possible amount of time. When we run the recursive solution on the case with 25 numbers, it takes about 12 seconds to run, which we've sped up here. With the DP solution, it returns very quickly. On the other hand, when we run the recursive solution on the case with 10 numbers but a high target, it returns very quickly, but the DP solution takes several seconds. But, when we run a memoized version on both of these, it returns quickly in both cases. We expect the memoized version to take about as long as the better of the two solutions, plus some overhead for the dictionary. Also keep in mind, Python itself takes some time to load, so these small times are even smaller in terms of how much processing is being done. This isn't a very scientific test, but it roughly illustrates the advantages of all three solutions. In a nutshell, that's the subset sum problem. Here are some further challenges you could tackle. Right now, we're returning whether or not it's possible to reach our target. You could change the program to return the subset that reaches the target instead. Also, how would you change your code if you could use each item multiple times? If you try this, you should start by assuming that all of the elements are positive. Finally, there are more complex versions of the knapsack problem. For example, there's a version where items have weights and values, and you want to maximize the value you take for a given weight. Or, you might try a version where you take all the items with as few knapsacks as possible. This is called bin packing. Next time, we're going to talk about a non-NP version of this problem that I've seen in a lot of interviews recently. How does this problem change if you have to use exactly three elements? That is, given a list of elements, find three of them that add up to some target. I hope you got something out of this video. If you have any questions, comments, something I've missed, or problems you want answered or covered, let me know in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more, it would be great if you liked the video, subscribed, or both. I really appreciate it. See you here next time on Coder Snacks.